<laughs> so I'm Yvette. I own and run Cafe Quiet. And I have another space, Quiet Terrace, actually. It just oh, never wow. to come out. It was supposed to launch in March and then COVID happened. So there's a wow. second space that you know, was supposed to come out. Um, what else do you want to know? I own Run Cafe Quiet. It's a dope space. Yeah, but why Cafe Quiet? Why did you? Why did you come? How did you come about that business? Why on earth did you decide to do it? So, it's a great. It's a great cafe. It's my favorite. Period. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, when I, I moved back to Ghana, two thousand eleven, and when I moved back, I didn't find any spaces that were similar to the cafes that I like to hang out with in. So I'm a loner by default. I like to be by myself a lot. So mm -hmm. cafes work for me in that you can go there, you can hang out, you can chill out, you can have a salad, you can have food to eat. It's just a very chilled out space. And I like those kind of spaces. So um, I always knew that I wanted to create something like that. In what shape and form, I wasn't sure. But I kind of in the back of my head, you know, you're dreaming, like, oh, one day I will have something like this. And, um, yeah, so basically I started with salads and sandwiches in my mom's kitchen. Um, <laughs> doing takeaway and delivery as an escape from, my mom has a school and I was taking care of kids and it didn't work out very well. So I needed to figure out something else to do with my life. And uh, salads and sandwiches came about and that evolved, got a space, Cafe Kwai. Basically that's how it came about. So, so uh, how, how long between the conception of the idea and the execution of idea or the implementation for you? Ooh, um, so I signed the expression of interest before they even dug ground. So I signed the expression of interest in 2012, and I didn't move into Cafe Quiet in 2015. So that Are was like, serious? yeah. So they had a lot of problems. There was water in the ground. There was, there was plenty of water. So literally, by the time we got to get into the space, it was 2015. That was three years. I even left and went to the States and came back. I didn't even know what was going to happen. And um, yeah, so that's what happened. Well, I mean, how did you have patience? How did you manage? Because obviously, let me, let me, let me circle back. So today mm. we are literally talking about how to pivot, right? Mm. But now you're, you're basically telling me that it took you three years to actually establish the space, to be in the space that you wanted to be in. Yeah. How did I, you make you, how did you pivot around that idea? So my friend's company were the development partners for One Airport Square, which is where I am. Okay. So, and I was feeding them sandwiches and salads from my takeaway. <laughs> okay. So I go into their office one day and I see the drawings and I just casually say, hey, this is the place my cafe is going to be one day. I literally just threw it out there. Um, and so when they start getting serious, I guess they're putting their branding and packaging together. And she calls me and says, hey, are you still interested? Because I remember you said you wanted to do it. And I was like, oh, sure. He's like, oh, you just have to sign up an expression of interest. Like, you know, it's, it's a long way coming. So you just, I was like, oh, sure. So I just signed, signed. And, you know, I was like, sure. If one day it happens, sort of put on my vision board that this is, this is where it was going to be. Um, and I just went about my life. And that about maybe a year, two and a half to almost three years later she's like ah the building is done madam please let's let's proceed and um yeah so that's why so i didn't i wasn't waiting per se i had stuff to do like i was doing stuff you weren't waiting but you were set on the space because you could have gone somewhere else oh no no i was determined i said i i always used to say I said, if i don't open my cafe here i'm not opening it anywhere else i always <laughs> I said, i'm not doing it here i'm not doing it anywhere else so um yeah so in my head i knew it was gonna happen i just kind of let the universe do its thing yeah okay excellent yeah. so so now we're going to we're going to fast forward and go back because you know me i'm an artist my my mind they, they work you know whatever place but speaking of how to pivot look everybody on this live or who's going to watch this afterwards knows that we've been in a strange and peculiar time absolutely crazy when a, so when i had a conversation with you and you you express we spoke and you you came about speaking about how to pivot mm. it is almost it is almost like uh the 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 requirements for every living being in the world right now yeah because we did not enter this year with any sort of inkling of what it was going to be or that it could be this there was mm -hmm. no way we could have seen this i, I mean it's topsy-turvy everything is turned around so mm -hmm. how how do you even mentally 
or, or how do you even go about trying to pivot around things like this that are almost a catastrophe? Um, <laughs> it took me, where were we? Long, we started, what, in March? Like, March. Started in March. I probably only got my head around it in June, like mentally. Like, I was going along with the notion, like, there was lockdown. And so it, it was really bizarre because you start with, okay, maybe this won't get here. Maybe it won't be as bad. And then, but you, then the first case is announced in Ghana. And then literally we saw sales drop, like people coming in, maybe hundred people were coming in and then five people were coming in. It was that like stuck. Wow. Yes. And I'm just like, what is happening? You know? Um, so that was pretty scary. And then they announced the lockdown. And so I'm a fiero myself. So I wasn't about to believe. <laughs> <laughs> so when they announced the lockdown, I was like, oh, let's knock this stuff up. We're going home, you know? But once I actually found it really difficult during the lockdown, not knowing one what was going to happen. Because also, because like New York and England were like ahead of us. So you could see what was happening in the hospitality industry, right? You could see restaurants closing. You could see people. I mean, and I'm on a lot of blogs and, like, groups with restaurant owners. And, like, the information coming out was just frightful, you know, because you're just, like... And, and it, even for them that have governments that are, you know, supplementing their income, you know, with, like, loans and, you know, we don't have that. So I was just, like, where is this going to end, you know? Um, so the good thing is I just started reading about what they were doing, what people who were, had already experienced kind of what we were going through. Um, mm. So then I just started taking notes, knowing that once we opened, this was what I was going to have to do, whether I was mentally ready for it or not. Because mentally, I don't think I was ready for it. I was just going through the motions. But um, I literally had to learn from, because I mean, nobody's reinventing the wheel yet. So it was happening in New York, it was happening in Europe. And like what my colleagues were saying is literally what I was writing down and trying to figure out um, once we opened, this was what it was going to be, if we opened, because we didn't even know when the lockdown was going to come out. Um, so so, so you, you, went, you went to school by yourself. <laughs> I did. But I love, but that's the thing though, and, and the, the nature of pivoting is you must be ready to adapt. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Because and, and as an entrepreneur, I do that anyway, because things are so fluid. No one day is the same in my life when I'm working. So there's always something. Something will break. Something will crack. Something, some story. There's always a story somewhere. So I've learned to be pretty adaptable. Obviously, this is like adaptation 120%. Like it's in a different world, you know. But um, I kind of was mentally ready when, once I said, okay, this is, this is my life. This is it. This is our new normal. What are we going to do to survive as a business? And I, I said, forget even profits. Just how are we going to keep our doors open 2020 to just make sure we mm. just survive? And then we'll think about profits and all that stuff later. Right now, we just want to survive. And what are we going to do to survive? And so literally, that's, that's what we've been doing in, in, in triage, as I call it. <laughs> just bandaging our wounds. Bandaging. So what are like two or three things that you've done? I mean, how, how so, have you um, So, obviously, well, for my business, um, I just had to cut down hours because nobody's out dining. So, we consolidated hours. We used to open from 7 to 10. Now we do 9 to 6, which is perfect. Um, I had to reduce my staff. So, we put our staff on a... On a, on a that must have been tough. Yeah. It was. But you know, also, I always say it beats efficiency because now you see who the real good workers are. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so we, we went on like uh, one week on, one week off schedule so that everybody would have at least some hours to work. I had to sort of cut my menu to what in the industry is called like a minimum viable menu. So what can work? You know, what can we use as many ingredients to do? So that we're not buying different different things, you know. So those are kind of things I had to, I had to do um, off the top of my head. Yeah, those kind of top three things we had to do, and we're still doing it. We're still working the, the limited hours because I honestly don't think people are going to be comfortable <laughs> sitting in a restaurant till twenty twenty one. Like, I mean, would you be comfortable? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have an outdoor space. I, I, or okay. just keep the door open. So even as we're really managing the numbers, if it's more than ten people, we people everybody has to sit outside. 
we open the doors regularly. So we're just really trying to manage manage the situation. So I honestly don't think it's going to get any better until about 2021. Like we have another year to go, I think, before we can start figuring out where we're going. From. There's a question here for you. I, I mean, I like that people are proactive. It's from Sandrine. She says, how massive a financial toll on her restaurant in terms of paying for staff and space? Like this, this, this big, did you guess? Like this massive. So we're literally um, down about 70%. Um, are you year, serious? Wait, 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 say that. Yeah, we're down 70%. about 70%. Year, year to year, year to date, year to date. We're down about 70, 70%. What's holding us? That, is that is in terms of revenue or in terms yeah, yeah. Of yeah. No, no, in terms of revenue. So, um, the good thing is, we're. <laughs> this is not happening to just me. This is like a global pandemic. So I had to one of one of the first things I had to do was sit down with my landlord and be like, "Listen, <laughs> this is what's happening. <laughs> I'm a cash business. People come and eat. I pay you. If I don't want to eat, I can't pay you." So we've had to sit down and have discussions with um, our landlords about, you know, rent abatement, rent stretching. Like, we have to get really creative with it. So that's kind of helped. And so far, they seem to be um, willing to help, let's just say. Because I think, and that's a good thing, because it's not, it's not just you that's happening to, like, worldwide, restaurants and malls are suffering with rent. Like, it's not, it's not just me. So this is not even like a, it's like a no-brainer almost. So, in terms of that, it seems to have helped. Um, but revenue, yeah, literally about 70%. Like, literally about 70% now. Do, so, do you think most people in these times have the courage or even the, I guess, in Ghana, they would, I guess, call it audacity to think that they, they are going to try and change or, 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 or I guess, petition for the changing the terms of, like, for instance, your relationship with your landlord, for instance. Is this something that you think most people are doing or is this something most people should be doing? <laughs> most people should be doing it because this is, it really is an act of God. So it alters the terms of your, your agreement somewhat, you know. So obviously you also have to be cognizant of the fact that the landlord also has liabilities and like, you know, so you can't just go and be like, I'm just going to pay my rent. So you have to be willing to get creative with it. And things like um, either asking for, so if your lease ends next year, for instance, offering to tag on maybe a couple more years to your lease so that if this period is, you're not paying rent or you're paying less rent, then you're willing to say, you know what, instead of me checking out next year, I'm willing to add two more years to my lease. So that you're not going to be looking for a tenant in two years. You know that you have me for another two years. You know, so you have to meet halfway because, as I say, they also have liabilities. So, um, I would definitely encourage anybody who's not doing that to, you know, read through their lease properly. Get, get, get over your shyness. Ghana for its own. You say, yeah, that. you can't be shy about. I mean, if, you, if you're, you're shy about it, means then you can pay it. I can't be shy about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be shy about. It. Don't you think Ghana? <laughs> A Ghanaian would rather tell you, oh, I beg you, you next week, there's a problem, like... Oh, no, no, you have to be, and, and, and as I said, I, I appreciate that it takes, it takes time. I didn't get to this position from day one of lockdown. It, it took me reading, researching, chatting to my friends who are lawyers, just trying to find out what possible solutions, and actually initiating conversations with the landlords, you know, because, I mean, they're human after all. So it's also about, you know, saying, hey, Charlie, this is what's happening, you know, just going, you know. Halfway. Yeah. So even there's three things I've, I've heard from you. The number one is just you literally need to dive deep and find out what's going on and what's like to to yeah. Don't put your head in the hands. It's not going to go away. It's not I'm, going to go away. You have to face it head on. Like <laughs> yeah. Number one, number two, like restructure. Even if that's not how your business is, because yeah. what you did with the stuff in the menu, that's yeah. absolutely like you have essential. to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Number three, go and ask for help. <laughs> ask for help. Because, and that's the beauty, the silver lining in all of this is that I find that it's made people kinder in a way. You know, I feel like people have realizing that Nipa and Sashi, literally, that you, you, are the, I think humanity is showing, I have found in my experience, that people are just generally kinder, gentler. You know, and so I think, I mean, the most I can say is no, 
And so, hey, you, you, you risk nothing in asking for it. Okay. Yeah. So of all the things you've done in terms of pivoting, what do you think has been the most crucial, most successful for you? Mm, I think um, making our menu tighter because also it helps us in terms of what we're buying and what we're spending that we can keep, you know, because cash is king right now. Everybody just has to make sure that you're conserving as much, as much cash as you can and um, not wasting stuff, you know. So for, for me, most of the high value items are off my menu. I'm not going to be buying salmon now. So we'll eat tuna from Macra. So, you know, those kind of things. So it's just trying to, yeah, tightening my menu has helped because it saved me a lot of money in terms of, you know, spending myself thin and trying to cover a lot of stuff on the menu. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, a question I like to ask people, mm. uh, you know, people like yourself who, because, you know, it's very rosy from the outside. For me, you are successful. Is it? Business. Yeah, it's rosy. Yeah. Ah, I see rosy. what you're doing. You see what you're doing? Like, it's amazing. I, every time I go to Cafe Quiet, there are people, etc. In general. Forget this was before people. COVID, though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Boy, you'd be like, oh, yeah, poor yeah. Cafe. Yes, same here. <laughs> but I, I think a lot of people, because a lot of people I speak with mm. in terms of this series are either in the beginnings of their business or thinking of how to figure these things out. Mm. So these things are trying to help. But so the one question I like to ask is, tell me a story about one of your biggest failures and either what you learned from it or how you maneuvered around it. It, it can be even before a cafe guy. Business failures. <laughs> oh, <laughs> tell me. You see, when I was on the phone with you, I told you I was, there are things I want to know and I was going to try and get some secrets from I'll you. Tell you <laughs> before I started my health food, um, my salads and sandwiches in my mom's kitchen, I was selling um, lingerie and adults' toys. That was like, I had like a fancy, you know, idea of opening like a boudoir, very like, you know, chic uh, place for women to come and, you know, explore sexuality and explore themselves. So I ordered all these items, you know, lingerie. <laughs> and then my mom is a presbyter. Let me just see. This was so not. <laughs> Oh, my mother is a senior presbyter at Skokomele Presby Church. <laughs> so obviously, when she found out what I was doing, she's like, hey, Nana, this business, dear, is for not survive in this house. Let me just tell you. What is the one in this room? Not in Ghana, in this house. <laughs> you just met. <laughs> so obviously, I had all this merchandise. <laughs> I had literally like $5,000 worth of merchandise that was hanging out in my wardrobe in the house that I had to like offload. And so thank God for girlfriends who support your business. My girlfriend had this space. We were like, okay, we need to sell all this items so I can move on with my life. We literally did one big party, invited a whole bunch of ladies, marked up the prices, got champagne, got cookies. We're like, ladies, let's just, let's just do this. So I've loaded that stuff. Needless to see. Yeah, that was not a very good, my first business, and it didn't go very well. It didn't go, but it taught me, it taught me about the, it taught me about the market because Okay. Ghanaians are very, or were, very, um, how do I put it? So somebody will call and say, please, I want to buy some. And I'm like, some of <laughs> So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, some of them. And so it was like, I felt like I was, a, I was like a coke dealer. I was like, if you cannot tell me, like, I didn't want to feel like I was selling, like, underground stuff. Because I had, like, this whole spiel was going to be fancy and, like, you know. So it taught me a lot about the, the market, you know. And then also... About myself, frankly, because I just, I was annoyed with my mother for being so difficult, but eventually I just got over it. And I was like, you know what, let me figure out something else to do. Because I know for sure I wasn't going to work for anybody. That one I knew, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew 100% I wasn't going to work for anybody. So um, I had to kind of figure out the next, um, the next thing. So that's my secret is out. You kind of slack because, you know, I could have used that your business to buy gifts for people, you know. You could have. <laughs> Don't worry, I still have contacts with the agents. It's only if don't worry, I can hook you up. I'm still on those streets. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. It, it, it's good. To, it, it's good to know. But okay, just a quick follow up on that. But what, how is it? 
how did you come to a quick realization and shake it that up quickly? Because for a lot of people, when we have when people have ideas and they're in love with the idea, it's very difficult to move away from it just because of some one roadblock, etc. How do you know that? Okay, this is an idea I have. If I have other ones, so let me just go. Like, how did you know? How quickly were you able to do that? How do you know? I I I I've loved reading since nineteen Kujuhu, and I read a lot about businesses and I like I like reading about people who start businesses and when you read those stories you realize people try they throw everything in the kitchen sink at ideas like people have a thousand ideas before one takes off you know and I actually come from a line of entrepreneurs my dad was an entrepreneur my mom's an entrepreneur my mom has tried a bunch of stuff before she started up the school my dad told us stories of stuff they had tried before you know finally getting to where he got to so mm-hmm. I think in that vein and also knowing perhaps that my family was there to catch me if I fell. So, um, yeah, I wasn't really just like, oh, another crazy idea by now. Let's move on. And, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out, you know, the next thing. Well, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, this, this all took about maybe nine months. You know, nine mm. months. It wasn't like, you know, two months thing. Like, it took a while. Travel. Whilst me, on the other hand, I've, I've still stuck on the same idea for how many years? <laughs> That, that, that means that's the thing you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> that's the thing you're supposed to do. But how do you know when is the thing you're supposed to do? Look, it's very difficult to know. I mean, it is. You're, it you're, is. You are, you're giving me this practical thing of, you know, you read, you kind of assess these things and say, okay, look, I, I like this, but based on even knowing other people's stories, here, yeah, don't fall in love with the first idea. It's, it's a difficult thing. I'll give you the example. Mm. I did studio. I make a lot of music, right? Mm. But my, I, I, okay, let me tell you the story. So, mm-hmm. my first album. Uh, uh, oh, somebody said I should bring the boudoir thing again. Ghanaians are becoming more like, okay, might not be so bad. Okay. <laughs> I think when I, I said when I'm 50, God willing, I'm going to do it again. At that point, nobody can tell me shit. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> exactly. Because at that point, that one, you don't need it for money. I mean, you, yes, you know you they'll probably know this crazy old man. Oh, she's so interesting. Go buy her things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, guys, keep your comments and questions coming because mm. I can, I can slot in it. Because one of the things I've been doing is hogging the line and asking only my questions. But guys, I ask your questions too. Mm-hmm. But so you, you make a lot. I, I, like when I was starting my first album, I was working with some uh, three producers. We had a collective, mm-hmm. and we put together a bunch of songs. I mean, I recorded with them lots of songs, and then I, I came to Ghana a bit and went back there, and then I. I, I gathered them all and, and I played them what I thought was the album then. I was like, okay, this is the album. And mm. it's, it's all produced by them all. They, they were the ones who had produced this, all the songs on it. Mm. They listened to it and they said, yeah, we don't think this is it. And you're right. <laughs> I was like, whoa. But what that did for me is that was a moment in which I stopped. If I was in love with something that I was doing, I was okay that if it didn't work, for me to still be in love with it, but not know that business-wise, this one ain't no be the move. You understand? Like, I'm happy yeah. that I did it, and I'm happy that I have the song. Yeah. If somebody asked me in an interview what's my favorite song, I'll say that, but it doesn't mean I'm going to put it as a single yeah. because I'm It's not every it. idea is a business idea, right? Because yeah. it's not it's not every idea that, that works or that is the time for it at that moment, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it could just be before I start, right? Look at Zoom now. Everybody's on Zoom. But a couple of years ago, you said to me, we're like, mm. I mean, the, the way Skype's Slack, I mean, I you understand. So I always say this, it's not every idea is, is going to happen at that moment. And at the right time, you have to believe that it will, it, will, it, will come, it will come full circle. Okay. So now the next thing I want you to do is give, give, give us an idea of how difficult, how easy it is to be in the hospitality business. And then, what are you doing so that you are not a Skype but you're a Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. So, uh, what did you say? Give me, give me what? An overview of how difficult your industry is. So, or easy. No, no. <laughs> so, worldwide, the hospitality industry is one of the toughest industries to be in. Um, because the hours are brutal. Um, you're dealing with customers. It's just a lot. So that's even before you come to Ghana specifically. And then here, the challenges... Okay, let me backtrack. Because a lot of people are not coming here in Ghana, are not coming... Well, now it's changing because there are a whole bunch of restaurants, right? 
But when, when I started, there weren't a lot of people who were doing hospitality because they loved to do it. It was just because maybe they wanted to be a nurse, but they didn't pass the exam. So <laughs> yeah, look for something to do. Or, <laughs> nursing is a big thing. Yeah, I find like if I have 10 applications, four of them are saying yeah, they want to go to nursing school. Anyway. So, um, and now I don't hire those people. I always tell them that I'm not going to hire you when you are one of be nurse because invariably you will bounce and leave me and I would have trained you and it's just a waste of my time. Um, so because mm. of that, mm. you don't have a lot of people who are in the industry because they want to be, you know? And that makes a lot of difference. When you have other countries where people go to school for hospitality, they that's their goal. The goal is to probably be a general manager somewhere and eventually own their own restaurant, right? But you don't have that. So the skill set is a major issue here. And then also there's the attitude of the average um, worker, which is not very encouraging. So there's lateness, there's lack of follow through, they're just not on it. You get like, so you, mm-hmm. you're, you're, I always say you're managing, you have, the work is difficult. And then you're also managing the people that you're paying. So even though you're paying them, you're doing the work for them because you always have to double check sometimes what they're doing. I mean, it's getting better. It's nowhere as bad as it was when I started, obviously. But um, that is very challenging, I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then what did you say? How do I make sure I'm not a... No, no the second one is how, what are you doing so that you are a Zoom, not a Skype? Ah, okay. So you have to try and stay relevant. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So especially now, where in my head I have told myself that takeaway and delivery and curbside pickup are here to stay forever because we have gone through a trauma i was reading something that the, the, the psychologist said covid is, is traumatic like we've literally gone mm. through a trauma as, as, as a race, human race right and it's gonna it's sort of shifted the way we think about hospitality because when you look at the scale of um risk on a scale of one to nine i think Restaurants are number eight or number nine. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's a dicey, it's, 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 it's a risky place to be. And so until we have a vaccine that people are comfortable with, I don't anticipate that people are going to be chilling in restaurants for a long time. You know, I mean, people will go, but the, the way it was before, when you come in, Kapikwa is packed and there's a vibe and people are chilling, people are laughing, it's not going to be happening anytime soon. So I'm really focusing right now on de- um, strengthening my takeout and delivery game. I mean, I was doing mm. that way before, but um, that's pretty much the bulk of my business now. Um, so we're really working to make sure that um, our food travels well. That's also part of how we even down decided what items were going to go on the menu. Because not every food travels well. I tell people, it's not everything that is meant to go in a takeaway pack. So those kind of things, investing in packaging that makes sure that our food lasts longer, um, trying to work on our speed um, and quality. You know, just trying not to compromise on quality, knowing that now that the, our hospitality experience is, is out. So we have to make sure that when manifest orders from Cafe will cry, even though you're calling on the phone and we're bringing it to your house, we have to make sure that you still feel a connection with the brand. And that's very difficult to do um, when the person is not sitting there. Okay, so for instance, mm-hmm. if you order something and we mess up in the restaurant, I can take it to the kitchen and bring you back what you got in a second. I'm just saying, sorry. But if you live in East Legon and you ordered food for me and I mess up, that's like annoying because now not only has the food taking 45 minutes to get to you, it's the wrong thing. We try to figure out, it's just annoying. So the goal mm-hmm. is to make sure that our hospitality game is tight, even though we're not interacting with customers as much as possible in the restaurant. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do. Hey, hey, you, you have it together. I mean, when I... When I don't I, have it together. Oh, we're trying. <laughs> when are you going to put yourself on the stock market? Let me buy some Cafe Quiet shares, man. <laughs> see me, see me, see So check this out. Mm-hmm. Me, obviously, uh, I'm a creative, but I also like sports. When I think of pivoting, mm. there's something that is essential with pivoting. You still need a center, right? Yeah, you need to plant. Because the pimple, so your one leg is there, and then you are check, check, check. Do you get like so compass? To... Exactly, <laughs> like compass, which angle, right angle. You just need to make sure that your leg. You have to plant, and then yeah. you. Mm-hmm. 
I find it very difficult in my business to pivot when it comes to, well, no, not me personally. I, or let me just say, like, in my business, it's very difficult because, like, more than it, times change. It's like you're saying, you know. Um, how do you make sure that you are not, that the thing that, the feed that is planted, number one, two things. Number one, it's not planted in the wrong place, like, in the wrong idea of what you need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then number two, um, basically, how do you find where to plant yourself? Because these are very difficult things because a lot of businesses fold. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Obviously, people forget that some years ago, people used to go to Blockbuster and they used to rent out all these things. And Netflix. You know I mean? <laughs> and Netflix happened. And then Netflix happened. I mean... Do you get me? So if they are centered on the fact that... But, no, but Blockbuster kind of lost their argument. I mean, I'm sure they could see the next week was coming. But they were still chilling. Just, Dude, I'm, Amazon was coming. Kindle was coming. I, there's, look, the music industry, there are people who had CD stores, etc. Yeah. You know, they're, unless there are only people who are... Okay, so for instance, the record business, people are, they are the same people who sell music. So they are my, I sell music, a CD, a cassette, a MP3, I'm selling it. So their idea to pivot, is, their ability to pivot is very easy. Mm. But I think, like, sometimes when you come into these things passionate, and I know you're passionate, obviously, about what you're doing. Yeah. How do you, what do you do? Do you consult people? How do you go about finding that center for the pivot? Because if you lose God, you run out of business. Because you, you center yourself in the wrong place, like we are talking to Blockbuster and them people, you go slack, and then you're out of business. Me, the way I am too, if I'm like, oh, you know, people always be, you know, they have an image of me, they're like, oh, he wears beads. If I just center myself in just one idea, and then I fall in love with it, and it's the wrong thing, Charlie, times will come, and then I'm gone. So how do you do it? What's your process of going through it? So, one, as I said, I like to read a lot. So I, nobody... It, in this life, nobody is reinventing the wheel. So there's nothing that I'm going through as an entrepreneur that somebody hasn't gone through. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's one. And so in my research, I found that when you're pivoting, that leg, that leg that you're planting with is planted in what already works. So as a brand, what already works for Cafe Quai? You know, what are our customers saying? What do they love about us? What, what are our high points? So already we have that. So that is what we even try to improve on. You see, mm. so you're not like looking at the idea and picking out some idea from like the sky. <laughs> Let me pivot to that. So you're pivoting. You're planted already in what works, and basically, a form of pivot could be improving on what already works. You know, so if customers are saying that you have a dope vibe, or they like the, they like the fact that you have healthy options on your menu, then a, a form of pivoting could be increasing the healthy options um, available on your menu. You know, getting creative with healthy options. Now people are going plant-based, veganism, there's all that stuff going on. So, and, and that's catching on fast. I can't tell you how many vegetarians come into choir, people call and ask for vegetarian meals. You know, so that's something that's obviously going to grow. So if, if, if we're already planted in there, then we could expand small and give more options to those people. And that's a form of pivot. Pivoting is not, I don't think pivoting is something crazy like a different different idea it really just could be about how do you transform your business to be better and it really is for me it's building up on what we're already doing and yeah, yeah so because you're not straying far away i feel like if you i don't know i saw this crazy idea recently where where did i go i saw somebody who sells i think i went to a a yoga place and then i went and they're selling jello i was like what what, what? Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> I was so confused. But I was like, why are they selling jollof here? Because I would not think to buy jollof in that location. A jollof and a hamburger. So I, I, I just thought that was so strange. Do you see? Because this is a case where probably what happened is maybe the, I suspect what happened is a place I used to sell like normal food next to them and they, they went out of business. So they probably said, oh, let's add the jollof in there. But it's not really what you think of when you're going to a yoga place. Yeah, I want a smoothie or something. Uh, also, so uh, that's not what I, what I was thinking. So for me, it's, I've, I've learned to keep it tight, do what I do, and I do best. I don't, people always say, why don't you have local dishes? And I don't know how to make them very well. I, that's my God on the street. So I won't try something that I don't know how to, to do. What do you get? There are so many places, Buka, there's so many that make great local food, and that is what they do. That's their strength. So let them have their own. Me, so I have my own. 
with my yeah. turmeric latte and my apple berry cashew salad and we're very okay you get exactly and plus i mean you have enough stuff like i mean what was the name of the, the shake uh, your friend is in full out yes yes you yeah know? i mean yeah it doesn't have to be the yeah. same thing yeah. Why? It be okay. yeah it's just making sure you're planted in what works and then try and figure out what else can you do to add on you know to what you're doing to make it better cool who's your mm. favorite high life artist of all time <laughs> <laughs> Because we may a die hard Dumba fan. Oh, of course, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, then, oh yeah, the one so without a doubt, Charles Kojo Fosu, aka Daddy Lumba, is my guy. But you, but you in Lumba dance, no man. Yeah, me, me, everybody. I'm not crying, man. Hey, Lumba, I'm dying. Hey, hey, hey. They be having such a thing. If Lumba is not around, I don't know what I'll do. Or you're my guy. I've been to several concerts. Or you're me do. Are you serious? Hello, I'm not just. Oh, me, you're fan, no, me, yeah. Person. Die hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so which language are you speaking? Slanging or slurring? Are you talking Ghanaian English? Which is fish? Not sure. I don't know. Trina normal Ghana. I know you Trina sounds like very Irish. Really I say it. Like, that, that, that's, that's their own business. Now, uh, mm. okay. Uh, you know, we're in a certain atmosphere now, so, you know, I have to ask you, you know, one, one or two tough questions because, mm -hmm. okay, how is it? I'll tell you one thing that I have noticed. In our generation, right, a lot of the entrepreneurs doing interesting things like you are women. I'm like, no joke. Men are still onto like traditional, traditional entrepreneurship for the, for the most part, in my mind. Those mm -hmm. who are adding a lot to the ecosystem that's different from what has existed are women. Mm -hmm. How do you maneuver? The millennial, another generation. Eh? Oh, me, the me a Gen Z, or me a millennial. Sorry. We a millennial. I'm me, me a Z. So. What's it? The me, me a Z. Z, Z, Z yeah, after, after me. Before X, me, me a X. Whatever is we are. <laughs> but I'm going to, I'm going to say the millennials. I feel like a lot of the young guys and the millennials are doing stuff. A lot of the young guys okay. in the cafe cry are doing like. They really got their yeah. hustle on more so yeah. than guys in my generation. Guys in my generation, I feel like, are still doing traditional stuff. But yeah. the younger guys I've been meeting, like early thirties, they're really about their hustle. Yeah, like ex express pay and I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're really about but, their hustle, I have to say. But all that to say, look, mm -hmm. let's be honest, man. Sexism and misogyny in Ghana is off the way out. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's Charlie Day in some other level, you know. In the world, it's a problem. How do you maneuver as a woman, as a businesswoman, entrepreneur, in in a, in a sexist world? Period. Like uh, for Askam, I don't even know how to put it any other way. Mm, I think <laughs> I don't know how I. You know, I, I my personality is such that I don't take I don't take anything personal, or I try not to take anything personal. So because there's a lot of things I don't notice, or I just will laugh and say, "Be like, eh, is that what happened?" Do you know what I mean? Like, and also because I own my own business, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I'm, I haven't been in the proper world that I have to, like, hear, that I have to deal with, you know, a lot of guys who are not, you know, being upfront. Um, but how do I deal with... I don't. I just don't take it seriously. You know, okay. I'll call you out. I might call you. I'm like, hey, then I'll be king. Or, you know, I might just, you know, point it out. But I don't... I try not to dwell on it. Or if I know it's because of that, I may not even notice it. That it's happening. Yeah. No, okay. So yeah. it's never been a case that, you know, whether you, you're talking to investors or you're talking to anything. Anyway, you're a solo person. You like to do things. No, like no, that. but actually, now that you say it, um, I've had a few people <laughs> approach me to say, let's, let's get into partnership or let's, you know, I'm interested in investing or something. And then you always realize that there's a, <laughs> oh, but do you want to go to Paris? I'm like, but why do we have to go to Paris to talk about what we're talking about? Do you know? So, I mean, I always find like, it's not, at least in my experience, it hasn't been hostile misogyny. Um, it hasn't been like, if you don't do this, I won't do it. You know, so it's just been, they're trying to see how, what they can get away with. And mm. depending on your response, then they also 
but if you act clueless and like I don't understand, then I think most people I've met seem to tend to back off and just let you be. Plus, as I say, I keep bringing up the Wesley girls, but when people find out that Wesley girls, they're like, hey, hey madam, it's okay. <laughs> when they find out, no, they're like, it's okay. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't know. They will say, yeah. So that's that. You- you people are to know. <laughs> um, so having that rep, you know, it helps small, you see. So, um, yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, okay, guys, you can ask questions now. Um, they are still... Okay, no, there are comments being made. Okay, so let, now if uh, you were to, to be um, talking to anybody starting a business now who just started because look i found out that a lot of people have started businesses during this covid era do you know that yes i mean they, they say during the time of crisis a lot of innovation comes out true except those who are who are who are trying to sell that transparent thing no? <laughs> That's hey please don't knock it so today i want one to a funeral it's very effective yeah but i i don't know if it's all the way safe so you need it with the no mask. you want a mask and then you wear the shield so that if there's anything coming directly at you know at chino not mask you know so okay. it was a mask and she was a you know double up combo okay 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 so i mean before i ask you what's your favorite thing on your menu at your restaurant my favorite thing on your menu is what's my favorite thing on your menu? i like the mm, it's not even exciting though but i really like our salads I love, I'm a salad person, so I love our salads. But our English breakfast, and then you swap the local normal bread for sugar bread French toast, and then you add avocado. I mean, it's, a, it's a very righteous combination, I have to say. Our sugar bread French toast probably is, after the salads, my favorite thing on the menu. It's pretty mm. good. Have you had it before? Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's very good. It's very yeah. good. Yeah, no, I, I like brunch and then the bottomless mimosas, you know. Uh-huh. You know, you know, guys, if you go to Cafe Quiet, you can have bottomless mimosas, which means that for a certain price, you can keep drinking for two hours. For two hours. For two hours. <laughs> <That's> when you <laughs> can't drink. <laughs> for two hours. If you, a bottomless mimosa, it's such a brilliant idea. A bottomless mimosa, guys, it means uh, you can you can for a certain price pay for a mimosa which is champagne and uh juice depends on which juice right yeah and though as you keep drinking they'll keep filling you out they'll keep limitless. filling till you drop limitless yes <laughs> wow. That's a wow. okay so the question is are you a solo pr- somebody says are you a solopreneur or do you have a co-founder how are you able to raise the capital so for cafe quiet which is my first baby mm-hmm. i'm a solo entrepreneur for Quiet Terrace, I have partners. Mm. Um, I guess building on the success of Cafe Quiet, um, mm. I was um, able to find partners, or I guess they found me. And um, so Quiet Terrace is a, is a partnership. But Cafe Quiet, I'm a solopreneur. Okay, so you raise capital by yourself? By myself, through friends and family. They came my, you know, begging them. You know this. Uh, you know Albert was on last last week, and that's what he tried to advise and people too. That, but you I mean, know, especially from where we come from, access to capital is very tough, especially if you don't have a track record. So it helps to have somebody who can help you, no doubt. Yeah, and look, I I also like to tell people. People like to be like my education. If we, I didn't use it even in my music, the one thing I would have used it for is a network of people who might be able to. Of partner course. with me. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And, and, and it's an essential part of it. People don't realize your net you know, worth. Ghana... Net worth, as they say. Yeah, yeah. That, got... that, I think we, we we have reduced education sometimes in Ghana to getting a diploma and degree and getting a job, a good job. Not realizing the network and the people and just developing yourself as a person and all that. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. So that is is an important part of it. Like I have. There's a whole alumni network of people who went to the same school that you can even try and tap into. And that's an important part of and, it. So. And, 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 and apart from even just giving you capital to start your business, it's also support once you start your business. Like for me, yes. I cannot tell you how many people, my seniors, my classmates, my girls, who would recommend me for catering gigs, who would call me to cater their board meetings. I mean, without that, 
those first few years would not have happened. So forget even the capital to even build a business. Once you get into business, you need a core network of friends and family who, who have got your back, who are willing to spread the word about what you're doing and who are going to be able to sustain you in business because that's really what's important, you know? Yeah, Christ the King says, Ghanaian network is nepotism, no cap. <laughs> that is true, but that's, that's not just Ghanaian network, though. I mean, it's like, I don't, I, it's like everywhere in the world. Literally, if you have an uncle who can help you, or a cousin who can help you, a big brother who can help you, who's not going to use that? If you're on good terms with them, that's it. Some people are just going to on good terms with people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody else says, address this. Not every business makes it. At what point will you advise someone to cut their losses and walk? Whoa, that's a good question. So... Essentially, I mean, business is cash, right? So it's, you, you're going to make sure you have cash coming in enough once you take out your expenses to have some to, you know, save up and, you know, either reinvest or to do something. So, but if it's a passion project, it's really hard to tell somebody to walk away. Do you see? Um, okay, put it this way. Let me redirect it. I, you know, if you started a business, a different business, yeah, because Cafe Kwai is successful, so we're not mm. going to use Cafe Kwai. You started a different business. Mm. Let's say, um, you already gave an example of the Boudoir, but mm. I'm trying to think. What, what else are you interested in? I want to use a real-life example. What else are you interested in? Okay, I'm you can't give me an idea. I'm yeah? actually acting, but my best friend be laughing at me right now, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, let, let's say you started a film company. Mm -hmm. At what point whether it's the time of uh, how old the company, at what point, what would have to happen for you to cut your losses and walk away from that film company? Oh, Senya, it depends on if you're not getting any takers. I mean, what I've learned from my research is that every business should be trying to solve a problem, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're solving problems. When you're an entrepreneur, you figure out a problem that needs to be solved. It doesn't matter what business you're in, you're essentially solving problems. So, so far as that problem can still be solved, I think you should still be in business. But what happens is, you know, like even with food, um, sometimes I find that, especially here, people will open businesses and leave it for other people to run. Do you know? So at that point, it, this is society is a very difficult place to do that mm. because even while you're there, as I see, <laughs> the stuff that is going down is, is, is yeah. clever. You have to so, be a hands-on business person, essentially. Exactly. So if you keep making losses or maybe your, and your product is not consistent, cleanliness is an issue, staff are not friendly, the place is not clean, after a point, I always say the consumers show with their money, right? So if the cash is not coming in or people are not taking or people are just, the response is just not great, I don't know. I feel like sometimes you just need to be able to say, I tried, but it's not, it's not going to happen. You know, yeah, and then yeah. sometimes too, like what we're facing right now, there's so many good restaurants, so many good bars, so many good clubs that are literally having to close because they cannot keep going on based on what is happening right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a reality they have to face. It up. is just, I mean, there's this restaurant in New York has been running for 20 years. The woman has blood, sweat, and tears she's given. But to her, she'll tell you that she was, her reason for opening was not to open a takeaway and delivery joint. She is yeah. in the restaurant because she, she, she's into that spirit of hospitality, seeing people coming in, that kind of stuff. So if she's going to run a takeaway and delivery business and earn a fraction of what she's earning, she's going to bounce. She doesn't want to do it, you know? So you have to ask yourself, are you in it because, you know, want to be in it? Or is it economically viable? Is your heart still in it? Because if your heart's not in the business, it's very hard, you know, to, to, to make it successful. You know, so actually, sometimes you should the touch final it. part the the final part of pivoting is sometimes you might have to actually take that centered leg and move somewhere else. And move somewhere else. <laughs> Especially if your heart is not in it. Do you guess? If your heart's yeah. not in it, it's just about the money. Sometimes you just have to touch a loss. Yeah. Okay, so my final question to you from Paragon McCoy. You know, I told you a lot of people are beginning and they're in the beginnings of thinking of it. So I think a lot of questions are coming from that angle. Here's the mm. case. I don't have rich friends or family, yet I need the seed fund. And I think the only way is to work under someone 
else to be able to raise that money? Is it a waste of time? At all. Experience is a fantastic thing. And through experience and hard work, I always say, um, people don't work hard enough in this town because hard work will open a lot of doors for you. And mm. um, because people don't, work a lot of, uh, like, people don't work hard in this town, once you work hard, you stand out. You know, so that alone is currency. That's your just banking. <laughs> that you can just take along the way in terms of referral. So working for someone, especially, I don't know what field it is, but experience, on the ground experience, always counts for lots. Always, always okay. counts for I said it was the last question, but I lied because somebody asked the question that I asked him before and I like it. And that would, that would be the perfect way to end. How did you come up with the name Cafe Cry? So my name is Yvette Nana Ama Kwai answer. So the Kwai is actually my middle name. So, so you're Kwai. We are Kwai. Yes. So literally it was named after my great grandmother. And she was like the, but you know, Kwai is not just like, like Amazon, like the source of wealth and light and, you know, taking care of the planet. You get like roots in just you are deeply rooted in the ground you know so that was my great grandmother's name so my that's literally that's how i got it and it was my father's grandmother and i was very close to my dad and my dad passed there so was a way of connecting to my dad and my heritage but still trying to make it chic you know hence cafe quiet as as anthony but and as we bring yes okay yes okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Bet, thank you so much for, for for being with us you're I welcome. Love Cafe Kwai. I like that you call, you have your handle is called Love Cafe Kwai because we love Cafe Kwai. Thank you, thank and you, I, thank you for having me. Hope, hope, hoping your choir, your your forest will, will be will oh. keep, be replenished and it will be your source for many for, for many things. So yeah. I will catch you after after things slow up. No, you know what? I think I'm gonna this week. I'm gonna order something for you. Do so that. You Do that. Support local businesses. Order food. Order food. Order food. Order food. Exactly. Much love. Thank you. Yvette. Thank you, Manifest. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Me too. I'm trying to find out to end the thing. Hey, what's happening? How do I end? Yeah, there we go.